This is episode 175 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 175 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Patrick Harris on the show, and Patrick is a commercial realtor with Cushman and Wakefield. And today we talk about high level development, land assembly, and all of the above, and got Patrick's unique takes on where the market's going and what's happening. Um, obviously, it's a moving target these days to figure out where our market is going to go. And with these rising interest rates, whether we're going to see real estate values come down and how significantly. I think most people have determined that we are going to see real estate values come down and, and we've already started seeing that. But the question is how far and for how long and exactly where does everything shake out? So one of the discussions we had today is the various different market forces that are competing and um, affecting what the final outcome will be. In addition to Patrick talking about recent deals that he's working on in the upper beaches in Toronto. Uh, Patrick is Toronto focused and he seems to know that market very well. He was a wealth of knowledge on this podcast and I'm confident you're going to get a lot of value out of this if you've ever thought about dabbling in development or thought about the high upside that that type of activity can create. For those new to the podcast and new to real estate investing, this probably is not a very good intro episode. Uh, so I'd highly recommend you go right back to episode one and work your way through this podcast. There's been so many gold nuggets dropped over the years and all the information is still relevant because we talk about core fundamentals uh, starting at the early episodes. Uh, for those who are getting value out of this podcast and have been getting value out of it. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment and rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, leave me five stars and let me know what you think. It will greatly help it to be picked up by the algorithm and get it out to more people. And if you're a YouTube watcher, then all the same, if you could hit the like, subscribe and notification bell and leave a comment, that'll help too. Uh, hopefully we can help this podcast help more people. So without further ado, let's jump into episode 175 with Patrick Harris. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Patrick Harris on the show today. Patrick, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so if you could refresh me on how we connected and um, how we uh, ended up on this call together. Um, I think we'd uh, spoken in December of last year. Um, I, was in, uh, I was in Whistler. Um, I just heard a listen to one of your podcasts. I forget who it was. And uh, yeah, I just wanted the, the opportunity to talk to you. So um I'm a broker at Cushman Wakefield, um, building out the multifamily capital markets desk uh, in Toronto, uh, and then also uh, principal on the invest investor side um, uh, through a you know small value add sort of opportunistic real estate investment vehicle mm. uh, called Cobblestone Capital. Okay, yeah. So this, you refresh you refresh my memory well. Yeah. So the commercial real estate angle, I think we talked, and um, you know we we haven't done a ton of of deep dives into commercial real estate. We've done it a couple of times. Um, so yeah, I know I think you had mentioned that you thought you could add some value on that front. So uh, why don't you start with the basics? Um, what you do as an investor, how you got into that, and um, and then we'll get into what you specifically do now. Yeah, sure. So um, started at, uh, I guess it started at Cushman Wakefield in 2015. Um, and, um, you know, my first couple of years were spent uh, in the office leasing side. So working with companies who are looking to lease space in, in Toronto. Um, at that time, there was a, a huge tightening of the office market. Um, it was really in the, the, the three or four years leading up to the pandemic, uh, Toronto is one of the tightest office markets in North America. Um, so enjoyed, you know, learning the business, uh, uh, through the occupier side. And then, um, probably in 2016 or 2017 started to focus my efforts more into the, uh, investment side of the business, um, working in the, uh, I guess, development and multifamily verticals, um, working on behalf of owners of, uh, commercial properties and, and investors of commercial properties and putting, putting deals together. And um, I think that through, you know, the two or three years um, in brokerage leading up to the pandemic, um, I developed some relationships, uh, you know, with lenders and um, uh, investors and, and recognized the opportunity to get into the principal side of investing myself, um, uh, uncovering opportunities and, and uh, you know, rather than coordinating or, or brokering a deal between a, a buyer and a seller, actually going out and, and raising capital and, uh, following through on, on these tra transactions myself. Okay. So that when you say principal, you mean you're, you're basically setting up some sort of an LPGP model and you're, you're the, uh, 
the working partner, so to speak. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, now give me an example of, of some projects that you've done recently. Uh, the last deal that, um, that we did was a, uh, this is a land assembly in the upper beaches in Toronto. Um, so we identified, uh, Kingston road as a, um, uh, like the as of right zoning there is, uh, incredibly attractive for, for developers. So, um, I think that, uh, the city of Toronto recognized the, the need to revitalize, uh, this, this strip of Kingston road, um, and promote development, which would, uh, you know, increase density along this, uh, uh, this strip of road, bring in uh, amenities and, and hopefully, um, you know, lift up the community around it. And, uh, so the Kingston road revitalization study was enacted in 2017 and provided developers with as of right density up to, a uh, uh, 3.5 FSI or floor space index, um, and, uh, up to six stories of density. Um, so, you know, you, you see a wave of development that's occurred, um, along the strip in and around the Toronto Hunt Club. And uh, right at the start of the pandemic, in Q4 2020, I uh, saw a property listed for sale, um, a fourplex with two garage units on a corner, um, about 50, 5,800 square feet of land. Um, and saw a massive opportunity there to sort of start up um, a land assembly. Uh, so closed on that deal in Q1 of um, 2021. Okay. Uh, and over the course of, um, you know, the next year started to put together other properties, uh, in this assembly, um, with the idea of packaging them up and then, uh, selling the assembly to, to a developer to take the project through its next, uh, uh, sort of phase. Okay. So, uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things you said. So, so 5,800 square feet was the first parcel. Uh, you said you did assemble others into that. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. How many so the neighboring um another two properties so uh 1439 um kingston road is a neighbor it was a uh owner occupied by a paralegal service okay um and uh yeah so it was able to to negotiate that deal uh package up the two and then uh flip them uh, you know uh, well we we ran a full process uh brought them to market uh as a package for about 70 about eight thousand square feet Okay. So 8,000 square feet. So that was a smaller one. So if it's 8,000 square feet and you said you have a floor space index, does that mean, so if it's 8,000, you can go 8,000 times 3.5 and right. yes. yeah. yeah. So that allows you to do 8,000 times 3.5. You're going to get 28,000 square feet of floor space. So how many apartments do you figure you can squeeze into that? Um, so I think that's probably a stacked townhouse site, but the idea was that when we initiated conversations with, um, uh, you know, four or five of the other neighbors, but we've actually, you've spoken to everybody in the block. There's 10, 10 properties on the block. Uh, and I think that the idea is moving forward that, um, the new ownership group will continue to add, um, acquire more, uh, acquire more and, and, and build mm-hmm. out the assembly really in order to, um, in, in order to make like a mis- like a true mid rise condo go, like you really need 10,000 square feet of, of land area. Um, so that you can accommodate at least a small underground parking, um, mm-hmm. footprint. Without that, you're really looking at stacked towns. But um, you know what I was able to to bring to the table is, in addition to these two properties in the small site, is uh, ongoing dialogues and relationships with the other um, you know owners on this on this block. So okay, um, in the in the brokerage capacity, we'll be assisting with the uh, uh, with the further expansion of the site mm-hmm. and um, with the idea of hopefully um, you know going bookend to bookend on the block. Um, uh, hopefully sometime in the next 12 months. Okay. Now, Mm -hmm. like, do the neighbors like kind of get dollar signs in their eyes when they find out what you're trying to do here? I mean, yeah, yeah. that's the tricky (laughs) thing. Oh, so you're trying to do this, huh? Well, my price is 10 million. Yeah. Land assemblies are one of the most frustrating, um, high friction parts of, of my business, both on the brokerage side and the investor side. Like when you look at a deal and, and you sort of recognize, you know, okay, there's 10 properties. If I can buy all these for market value, you know, you're achieving at, you know, in some cases, hundred percent lift in value based on the, you know, the overall site. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But what you don't think about until you go through a couple of these is the um, difficulty in transacting with 10 different individuals whose sole intention is to achieve the highest value for their specific property. Um, which is why, you know, when, when you're talking about a, a two or three property assembly, it's, um, you know, 
it, the, the difficulty of, of putting these deals together compounds with the more individuals that you bring in on, yeah. the, on the vendor side. You know, what do you do if you get one that's just belligerently unreasonable? I mean, doesn't that just kill your project or do you acquire all around them and just wait them out? Um, I mean, obviously to do that, you need a, an equity play people who are willing to park their money as equity partners and just wait and wait and wait. Yeah. So, um, I guess there's a couple of different, well, first and foremost, we, we really spend most time on, um, you know, adjacent properties. So in this case, at the very least, we knew we had a stock town, townhouse mm-hmm. site and, you know, um, it, it, once we had those two, then we can really get more aggressive with the third one in and the fourth one in, uh, where, you know, there's obviously a high degree of risk. If you're looking to close on something, um, where there's a couple of properties in between. Um, so I guess that's, you know, we really focus on going one at a time rather than mm-hmm. just, you know, spraying offers at, uh, at 10, 10 orders at the same time. Um, but then it's also like one of the really important things is to structure your deal in a way that reduces the cash burn. Um, because you know, oftentimes it could take twelve or eighteen months to to tie up all these properties. So, um, you know, we're talking about um, buyer friendly vendor take back mortgages, um, uh, extended due diligence periods, extended closings, um, which obviously defer any capital outlay and, and reduce uh, um, well extended DD and extended closing reduce your ca- or uh, extend your capital outlay. And then um, you know, vendor fr- or sell- purchaser friendly uh, vendor take back deal structures help reduce your, um, your cash burn. Right. So in this, in this particular deal, um, for the second one, and we were able to negotiate a deal where the owner occupier was entitled to stay for a period of two years, mm-hmm. um, at zero dollars net rent. So, so just covering their operating costs, so their taxes, mm-hmm. utilities, insurance, all that stuff. Um, and in return, um, they provided us with an 80%, um, loan to value, VTB at zero percent interest. Um, nice. So you're effectively buying a, you're buying a property based on its land value. Um, and if you're to take conventional financing and, and try and close the deal that way, it'd be very difficult to stay to avoid being too far um, into the red in, in terms of cash flow. Yeah, that's um, the, the part that's going to scare a lot of people is because you have no guarantees in development usually, and you yeah. know if you're burning real money, then you know that's a tough pill to swallow. Of course, some larger developers can do that because it doesn't matter if they have a couple of losers. But for smaller time developers who are coming in, it might be their first or second try. They're not going to want to do that. Yeah, they're going to want to get equity that. partners, or they're going to want to get a deal like you've you've you know spoken about there where. I mean, that's a sweet deal. So you're getting a 0% VTB for letting them rent out at that net zero. Uh, you know, they just cover their operating. Is, is that something that that's commonly negotiated or is that, is that sort of a unicorn type deal? Um, I think that's, that's uh, about as good as it gets from our perspective, just because um, it's easy enough to go through the conventional financing uh, process, which as you know, is becoming more and more difficult with where interest rates are going. Mm -hmm. Um, but in this case, it was a win-win. I mean, um, these guys understood that the value of their property, um, was optimized if they sold to a developer. Um, they recognized that they still had a couple of years that they wanted to, um, uh, use to to wind down their business. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to stay. So I think that's, um, you know, one of the, the, well, I think the most important thing, uh, or, or a sort of, um, one of the most important elements of these uh, land assemblies is really understanding who's on the other side of the deal yeah. and trying to structure something that's, uh, that's mutually beneficial because okay. you can't, you can't slam this down, um, uh, people's throats. Like they have to be uh, a willing uh, yeah. participant in the deal in order for it to make sense. Yeah. Like walk me through your, your sort of approach you're approaching, you know, neighbor beside you. It's the first conversation you've had, you know, do you bring this up in the first conversation or is the first conversation, Hey, I'm your new neighbor. Here's a bottle of whiskey. Like what, what's your approach? Yeah, no, I certainly, um, I, I think that it's, um, you know, only fair to state your intentions right off the bat, um, and just say, Hey, here's, here's what I'm looking to do. Um, here's why this is an opportunity for you. Um, and, uh, and basically put it back in their court too let them uh, tell you how they'd like to see a, a potential deal unfold. And um, in this particular case, right? Like these are all investment properties and, and people own investment properties in, in order to make money. Um, and uh, you know, if you can show them an exit that, that makes sense for them, um, they're often mm-hmm. willing to discuss. And, and the other thing is that I'll notice is that people are always willing to talk about what their properties are worth. Um, you know, in, in my days as a, as an office leasing broker, um, you know, Companies weren't always willing to talk about what their relocation or renewal strategies were. 
but um, you can call pretty much any property owner and say, Hey, listen, I'm interested in buying your, your property. Mm -hmm. Um, We'd like to have a conversation about what it's worth. Mm -hmm. I think that just the general curiosity of, of human uh, nature um, is such that they'll give you five, 10 minutes. And Mm -hmm. um, if you have a compelling story, then often it can progress for that initial conversation. Do you do an, an, if, an, if kind of close with them to get them into the conversation? Like, Hey, if I can show you, uh, you know, something that I'm working on, or I have an idea or a proposal for you, if I can show you a way you can get top dollar for your property, uh, in a win-win for both of us, is that something you'd be interested in hearing about? Do you take that kind of approach or do you have your own, you know, kind of unique strategy there? I'd say, uh, Andrea, it totally depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, there's another one that we were working on in, uh, on Berkeley street in, um, uh, in old Toronto to downtown East. And, um, you know, that, that was an interesting property where, um, mm-hmm. there was a complete mix of participants on the vendor side. So, you know, you had uh, a lawyer, you had an architect, you had a like private investor, and then you had a third generation, a third generation property owner, um, with varying degrees of sophistication and varying, um, and completely different motivations. Right. Um, so with your approach is really going to depend on who you're talking to. But mm-hmm. I, there's a general understanding in Toronto. Like Toronto is an interesting market because um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, butcher these stats, but I, I think that Toronto has around 175 cranes in the sky, um, and wow. I think that the ne- the next um, highest number of cranes in any market in North America is something like 75. Um, so there's there's an excessive amount of development going on, and uh, you know, the, the investment or the real estate community still believes that we are substantially undersupplied mm-hmm. given the current vacancy levels and the, um, and the degree of immigration that, that is expected over the next five years. So, and people know that and people understand that, um, uh, you know, if you have a property downtown, unless it's a skyscraper or, or a mid rise, at least that the highest and best use for this property is quite oftentimes is a development site. Um, and, you know, I think that as a, as a young investor, um, in the market today, um, you know, it's, it's a, you can really earn your sweat equity by having these conversations and going out there and identifying potential sites and, and you don't need mm-hmm. a whole lot of money to do it. Right. You can, you know, put in the work to, to combine a couple of these properties and package it up for a developer to take to the next, uh, uh stage of the process. And when you, when you think about putting in the work, you're, you're going in on your own, or you already have sort of an equity partner with deeper pockets that's ready to, to put down down payments as needed. And you're just negotiating these deals like what you've described to me. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it depends on the, uh, on the size of the check. Um, in the, uh, the Kingston road deal, for example, I had a, a 50% uh, partner. Um, we just used personal uh, savings. Um, you know, that was a residential property where we were able to get 75% loan to value on the, uh, on the first piece. And then the second piece was just uh, an assignment, mm-hmm. right. So that we packaged it in before having to close, mm-hmm. um, you know, the deals that I'm looking at right now are, um, uh, a little bit larger in scale, um, where, you know, we would probably, I would look to put in probably 10% of the equity component, mm-hmm. um, and then raise the, the other 90% either from one, uh, JV partner or, or LPs. Okay. So yeah, obviously it's easier to work with one, um, than it is to, to bring in a whole bunch of people, but how often are you finding that you're, you're having to piece this out? Uh, I know, I know it obviously depends on the amount, uh, you know, are you getting into projects where you need to raise $10 million cash in order to, yeah. So we're, we're looking at a bunch right now. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that, I mean, just through my job, right over the last uh, uh, ten years, mm-hmm. um, I have you know some strong relationships with either deep pocket investors or um, you know guys who have um, uh, access to that kind of capital. Yeah. Um, and to your point, I think that when you're going out and you're doing a project like this, like having the flexibility of um, being able to make decisions with one conversation rather than mm-hmm. um, uh, having to loop in you know several people um, is huge. Um, and if there's the ability to, um, uh, you know, secure whatever, whatever it is, nine, nine, $10 million from, uh, from one group or, or from a, a couple of individuals, it's certainly mm-hmm. a lot less friction than, um, having to go out to 20 or 25 LPs. Um, now when, when people are said, investing that kind of money though, are they not a lot more, um, and I don't mean this to, to sound, um, the wrong way. I bet. I mean, I guess it's sophisticated in that they want more control. It, like, are you find that, or do you find that people willing to write those kind of checks are 
more just trusting and, you know, they'll let you sort of write the terms in terms of how the relationship will work. Uh, like, tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's, uh, it's more expensive equity, right? Um, mm-hmm. I think that if you're going out and you're raising 25 grand at a time, the, uh, the waterfall and the, um, uh, the hurdle rates are going to be a lot more, um, attractive to the, you know, to the uh, sponsor. Um, and when you're going to one group, you're, you know, they're, uh, there's lots of a uh, um, uh, distribution towards the GP rather than um, uh, if it is just typical GPLP structure. Um, and then in terms of trust, like, look, these are uh, these are not you can you can view these as risky deals, but at the end of the day, it's um, mm-hmm. uh, these are deals that are uh, brick and mortar deals with uh, very few moving pieces compared to a t- typical development deal um, with tremendous amounts of upside, right? Um, and at the end of the day, you're, you're buying real estate and, uh, with the idea of, of packaging up and, and, um, achieving yeah. you know, immediate substantial returns, but your downside is, is owning, you know, land in Toronto. So, um, that's really, that's really our value proposition is that it's, uh, um, disproportionate, uh, upside on, on, yeah. uh, these transactions and, and with the ability to hold long-term. Well, I think that it's, it's like a lot of things are when it comes to development is, is you have massive upside potential, but you, you, there are quite a few that you'll spend money on and won't make, uh, you know, won't make it back. Now, in your case, you're saying you're not going into stuff that you need to even rezone. Like you're saying the zoning is appropriate already. Um, I mean, yeah. Or is it just in entitlement? In that particular deal. I mean, like anytime you can, um, you can find land and whether it's a secondary plan or a designated area, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't require a, a lengthy, um, like official plan amendment then obviously you're, you know, it becomes a lot more attractive to the development community and your, your terminal value increases. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's not to say that if I you know found an opportunity that needed to go through a um, yeah. official plan amendment that I wouldn't do it. So it would have to make sense. And, yeah. um, I think that especially in a lot of these, uh, secondary markets in, in uh, the GTA, like I'm thinking about Aurora, uh, new market, um, and at Cooksville and Mississauga, like there have been, um, you know, sweeping changes to the secondary plan, which is, okay. um, you know, meant to, to promote development and increase density. And there's a ton of opportunities. Mm-hmm. So in, in your case here, then, um, you said it's Kingston road, right? Yeah. So do you, do you have zoning now or you just have the official plan is in, is, is correct for what you're trying to do? Like it, it fits with the official plan of the city. Um, yeah, I mean, like th- we might look to push it, uh, above the, um, uh, the 3.5 FSI or above okay. the six stories, but yeah. uh, it's a much, it's a much shorter entitlement process. Okay. But mm-hmm. so, so there wouldn't be pre- presently zoning. So you'd need a zoning change, official plan amendment in order to proceed. But obviously you're not, you sold it off, but if you were to have proceeded to, no, to yeah, you just straight to, you straight to site plan approval, straight so, to site plan. Um, okay. The, so the zoning's already yeah, there. Yeah. We'll allow for it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. That's yeah, what I was exactly. just trying to confirm. Yeah. That's yeah. so that's obviously a lot different than, yeah. Like you said, when you have to go get the official plan amendment, um, there's a lot more time involved in that. And then some people want, you know, have to do the zoning change as well as, as, as part of that process. Um, and cash burn and, and risk, yeah. right? Like everyone knows where interest rates are going right now. And, um, you know, we're seeing particularly on the rental side, like it's, uh, mm-hmm. there's a while there, um, two years really, um, where interest rates were so low that you could really make sense of a terminal cap rate of like three and a half, mm-hmm. you know, 375 basis points. But, yeah. um, you know, now you're looking at the value of, of rental in, in two or three years and you're, you're sort of seeing, yeah. um, you know, the 10 year, uh, bond rates at whatever they are, three and a quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very difficult to justify a, a 4%, um, cap rate, you know, in two years. And then if you start to push out your, your completion date to, you know, three or four years, there just becomes too much risk to make sense of, it, uh, yeah. terminal values. Yeah, that's actually a, maybe a, a nice segue. What what is your take? I mean, obviously you're transacting in this market. Uh, I like to get the different you know educated investors' opinions on what what they think is happening and um, kind of how to proceed in this market. So knowing that interest rates are going up, I I agree with you that that, that makes things tricky. Why why invest? You know, how can cap rates st- say stay low when interest rates are going up the way they are? Um, well, I think that everybody hopes that there is a healthy enough spread between interest rates and cap rates, um, you know, over the last two or three years. Um, I mean, you can make the argument that, um, you know, there is some room to absorb, uh, you know, interest rate, uh, hikes, but, 
Um, I'd say that it's, it really depends on what asset class you're looking at. Um, you know, for in multifamily, we've seen a lot of guys, um, uh, really focus on the MLI select program through CMHC. Are you familiar with that at all? No, recap me on that. So MLI select is the, uh, it's new program through CMHC, which basically rewards, um, developers for building, um, there's, there's three scoring systems. So, um, there's three buckets of, of scoring. One would be greenhouse gas efficiency. Um, the other, uh, would be uh, affordability. So the number of units that, um, who's, I guess, rent falls under 30% of the median household income. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third is accessibility. So, um, you know, new projects that score high enough in these three areas or are high enough in one of the three areas qualify for either uh, 40, 45 or 50 year amortization mm-hmm. period um, okay. and up to a 1.1 uh, debt service coverage ratio. Um, so in some cases, projects can be financed up to, you know, 90% loan to, loan to cost okay. um, with, a, uh, with a longer amortization period. And I think that what that's done is it's really reduced the... Um, uh, the debt service um, for groups when they're when they're looking at projects, um, and and the, I think the motivation uh, from you know the federal government is to provide um, a little bit more um, you know liquidity to developers to build rental mm-hmm. housing because you know if you look at fifteen projects, fourteen of them are going condo right now because condo developers can um, ultimately bid higher than purposeful rental builders. Yeah, that and I've noticed that spread too. It makes more sense to just condo things and sell them off than it does uh, to rent them. And you know, showing yeah, showing why yeah, there's not a lot of incentive for landlords to create new units right now. Um, it, no. it's better to just sell them to homeowners. But that, of course, you know, may may very well change going forward. Uh, you know, depending on how hard it becomes to buy a house. Well, that's that's the thing, and I think that um, if you just look at condo versus rental, um, you know, for the last like ten years condo prices haven't really made sense. And what I mean by that is that if you're just a retail investor and you buy a pre-construction condo at King and Spadina in Toronto, um, you know, the, the price of that condo is such that, you know, you're going to be in the red every single month. And uh, these investors are banking speculatively on appreciation. Um, and, and which is, which is, you know, realized like the guys have made a lot of money over the last, you know, 15 years doing this, but at some point it's got to stop. And I think that with where interest rates are going right now, it's going to have an immediate impact on uh, retail investors and um, mm-hmm. uh, consumers before it has an impact on um, institutional or investment grade uh, multifamily. That's an interesting point. Yeah, because those those weren't the same. But a lot of a lot of um, apartment buildings that are, are specifically rentals are still condo mm-hmm. status, but they're not operating operating as a condo. That's yeah. just more of a yep. flexibility and a tax advantage um, type play. Yeah, like the, from a tax, it's it's very advantageous from a tax perspective because you're getting dinged at the uh, mm. the single family uh, mill rate, right, rather than the multifamily. Yeah, and then we're also hearing a lot of investors uh, today talking about the um, uh, like the, the political risk um, in the marketplace. Like as you know, if you if uh, a purposeful rental project has been built after 2017. Um, rent control is not enforced on, on those units, right? So if market rents jump up 10%, you can mark to market every single year with your, mm. with your tenants. Um, yeah. So p- buildings that are being built today, a lot of um, uh, either builders or end users are actually um, uh, stratifying those units so that if down the road, say the NDP comes into power and um, reimposes rent control on new product, mm-hmm. they have the opportunity as an exit to sell those to the uh, to consumers. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Cause you know, it happened, it happened just previously, right. Cause it, it was rent controlled up until 1993. And then it, who was it that changed that? Was it the liberal government in Ontario that changed that? Well, Doug Ford did it most recently in uh, uh, 2017. Did he? Oh, I thought it was right before him. Um, okay. So I, I, yeah. I believe, I, I believe. Yeah. That's a very unconservative thing to do, but, uh, <laughs> let's <laughs> yeah. not even go down that, that rabbit hole. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah. Shocking. Um, so anyway, so, so that happened and it, it, it just goes to show you can't trust what the government says. So they say, you know, they give you the incentive to build it, but we don't know, like you said, at two years, they might, they could just undo that. But I, yeah, I have one like that, that I can increase it, whatever, uh, whatever I want. It's nice. It's nice when you got that flexibility. Well, particularly with where rents have gone over the last two or three years, right? Um, mm-hmm. And depending on what market you're in, it could be you know, it's as high as ten or twelve percent in some markets, yeah. right? So, 
Um, you know, I've never done the big increase with the tenant, but I have to assume they wouldn't love it, but uh, they always had the option to leave, right? They have enough notice. They can just say, okay, well, I get it, but yeah, that's not going to work for me, but then they're going to look elsewhere and realize that it's no cheaper. So, yeah. Or if you want cheaper, you're, you know, going from a 2020, um, vintage building to 1965 and mm-hmm. less efficient and all the other things that come with the older stock. So, um, yeah, I think it makes sense. And I think that, uh, uh, moving forward, it's, um, you know, mobility of, of, in, in, of tenants is ultimately going to help, um, uh, increase supply and increase investment back into some of these buildings. Okay. Um, but without getting too political. <laughs> no, I, I think it's an interesting, like as an investor, we have to realize the political risk of, of our investment strategy. Like we have to be aware of it, right. Understand the the more liberal governments are, or left-leaning governments are going to do things that are going to, you know, throw a blanket on what we're trying to do and, yeah. uh, and potentially, you know, things that could be very damaging. So, uh, I know obviously that's a reason why a lot of people are looking to other markets, you know, or kind of looking to get that political hedge. So if something happens here, you know, they have their, you know, their hand in other things and other markets, what are your thoughts? Like as an investor is Toronto, you're investing home. Are you spread in other markets as well? Uh, tell me a bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, um, well, first I, I think that a lot of the value that, um, I can bring is based on relationships and market knowledge. So if I was to, you know, step out and, and try to maybe, uh, invest cross border and, um, you know, whether it be Florida or Texas or, you know, the Sun Belt and a lot of the other places that investors are going right now, um, I think I'd end up with egg on my face, um, or certainly a, just a lot of work that would need to be done in order to get myself to a level where I'd be confident mm-hmm. to, you know, um, deploy other people's capital. Yeah. Um, I like Toronto. I think that, you know, as, as a market, I think that, um, uh, from, just from a macroeconomic perspective, um, you have supply that is going to remain relatively constrained just on base, just based on how expensive it is to build here. Mm-hmm. Um, you have, uh, all of the, uh, immigration that's happening across Canada and, and inevitably I forget what it is like, uh, three or four out of every 10 new Canadians are ending up in the GTA. Um, you have the restriction on supply, uh, with the green belt going around the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, just, you see what's happening to, um, you know, with, with the growth story in Toronto tech is substantial. We've got, um, a huge tech sector. We've got a growing, um, uh, life sciences sector, obviously mm-hmm. some of the best universities in the world. And, um, uh, ultimately I think that all of those, um, sort of macroeconomic forces, um, uh, will offset any of the political risks that exist in the market today. Yeah, sure. Political risk is part of it. And then of course there's the interest r- the interest rate force in the other direction, right? So th- this is what everyone's wondering is where, where does the ball land? Like, obviously we have a yeah. bunch of forces on this side, a bunch of forces on that side, interest rates are going to force things, um, probably into a more balanced market, but we're in such a seller's market in Toronto and GTA and in tr- Ontario as a whole like they could interest, they could raise interest rates 2%. And in a year and a half, two years from now, we're still in a seller's market, but less of a seller's market. Maybe instead right. of, you know, for, for single families, instead of like a, you know, half a month average days on market, now we're up to two months average days on market. Um, do you have any gut feel on that of where it's going to go? Do you think we're going to stay in a seller's market uh, for both, you know, homes and, and in the uh, investor space as well for these multifamilies? Yeah. So I honestly, I think that they're so tied, they're so connected. Um, and the reason behind that is, uh, like the demand right now, um, you know, from a leasing perspective for multifamily products across the GTA is really being driven by the costs and the unaffordability of single family homes. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I said before, I think that, uh, consumers and and retail investors, um, are going to be hit the hardest by the, um, increase in, in interest rates. There's a lot of people out there on, uh, variable mortgages, um, a lot of people with, um, home equity lines of credit and both these investors are, are, you know, just households aren't necessarily prepared for the, um, uh, the rise in the overnight rate. Right. Mm. And, um, so I think that if you were to see maybe a 15 or a 20% correction in, in single family homes, it would probably, um, uh, have a major hit on the condo, um, industry, um, and if there's a hit on the condo industry, I think that, um, you know, maybe the trades and, and, um, uh, materials would have less pressure on pricing. It'd be become easier to build. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's kind of what's required to get the, the balance back in market yeah. market, because, 
Um, it's just gone out of control. And obviously, you know, that the monetary policy that's being enacted by, um, you know, the fed right now is, is in response to how out of control that it has got. Yeah. Um, so how, how will I, 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 I completely agree with you. There, there's so many forces on, uh, on either side. Um, I think long-term I'm, I'm bullish on Toronto mm-hmm. and on Canada, but I think that, um, we've gotten ourselves into a bit of a mess right now. And it, it's hard to imagine a scenario that, um, doesn't result in, uh, a small pullback in, in pricing and values, yeah. um, in, in, the, in, at least in the short term. Yeah. I think no matter what, there's going to be this short term hurt, um, with pricing, uh, you know, they're, they're increasing interest rates when we don't really have any real economic growth. If you adjust for inflation, especially, um, true inflation versus the one that they report. So yeah. they're going to have to acknowledge that we're kind of in this stagflation scenario where we haven't stopped inflation, but we have negative economic growth. And what are we going to do about that? And I think that at some point they may just conclude, we're just going to have to maybe live with a certain higher level of inflation than we would ideally want. That's just a feel I have. I don't know if that's for sure where, where we're going. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, and, and you could also make the argument, I've heard this from some people, um, some smart people who are saying that they're basically just um, replenishing their war chest. Um, if there's a, if there's a recession that occurs when interest rates are at rock bottom, there's very little they can do Stimulate it, and yeah. they, they may be pushing them, um, yeah. at an uncomfortable pace right now so that they're able to, or they have some weapons in their, um, uh, at their disposal to drop them down if yeah. and when the, the big one comes. Right. Yeah. And then the other, I mean, like with interest rates, you have the, the overnight rate that's been increasing. Right. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, what I'm more interested in is where the 10 year bond market is. Right. Yeah. Um, because that's the alternative. The, so that's your argument. Cause that's the alternative investment. The safe investment is the 10 year bond rate. So why invest in real estate when you have a safe investment that yields almost the same cap rate? Well, it's the 10 year. It's yeah, it's, it's the exactly. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, oftentimes, well, CMHC, um, interest rates are just based on a, a spread above the 10 year mm-hmm. CMB or government of Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the invert inverted yield curve, like you can see that, um, it's actually being priced in, uh, a future reduction in interest rates. Right. Um, and so, you know, when you see that when you see the government, the, the 10 year bond market staying flat while you have all of these, um, increases in the overnight rate, it basically just implies that those hikes have been priced in. And, you know, maybe, um, investors aren't so sure of whether or not they're going to stick. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, th- th- I think this is being done as a, uh, as a short term, um, response to, to the inflationary pressures that we've seen, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, you can make the argument that they'll be reversed in the next 18 to 24 months once the, uh, uh or if, and when the economy starts to go south. And I think gotcha. that the definition of a recession is just two straight quarters of economic contraction and, um, you know, we already have one, so, so we'll be there by next quarter. No question. So exactly. yeah. Yeah. Which we were in recession, um, when, when the lockdown started and that was, that was a no doubter. I mean, people were asking, I'm like, by definition, we've shut everything down. There's no question. We're going to be in a recession. Um, yeah, yeah. so yeah, we're going to, we're going to be there. And then, yeah, like you said, they're going to want to stimulate things again and maybe they drop them back down. We'll see. Um, you know, time, time's going to tell it's tough to predict, right? You know, I used to be able to, you know, say like early 2010s, uh, people would talk about upward you know, pressure on real estate. Uh, so upward pressure on interest rates are like, Oh, interest rates are going to rise. I'm like, yeah, but we haven't really fully recovered from 2008. And every time people would ask me, I'm like, normally you, you, you start raising interest rates when you you know, your growth really starts going, but we never did. Mm-hmm. We, yeah. we never really did. So uh, and that held true, but now I don't feel like it's as obvious or as easy to predict what people are going to do um, in these in these uh, uh, fiscal policy positions. <laughs> it hasn't it yeah. hasn't followed traditional economics, I would say. Well, no, and I mean you can um, uh, you can look at it and sort of ask why or who, who's making the decisions and um, uh, mm-hmm. how qualified are they to be making the decisions for everybody, yeah. right? Um, yeah, but these these questions could get us in trouble if we talk too much about them. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, Patrick, uh, you seem to be a wealth of knowledge. Really appreciate this conversation. Is there anything you would have wanted to talk about that we haven't covered? Um, no, I, I I think we, we, you know, covered the, uh, just the macroeconomics of rising interest rates and increasing construction costs. Um, I guess that the construction costs, we didn't really touch on that much, but, um, you know, they've gotten out of control since, uh, the start of the pandemic and, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that those, um, 
and need to be addressed as much as interest rates, right? And uh, so long as we have 175 cranes in the sky, and um, you know, it's it's going to be very difficult for uh, um, for those mm-hmm. prices to come down. And and as long as the mm-hmm. prices are, are where they are, we're always going to have an affordability problem. So yeah. um, I'm I'm just of the I'm of the mindset that um, the only answer to affordability is to increase supply. Yeah. Um, that it's purely a supply and demand issue and yep. demand's not going anywhere. And, um, uh, mm-hmm. we have to make it cheaper and, and faster for builders yeah. to uh, bring new products to market. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I would agree with you. I mean, of course you can manipulate demand and they'll do that by, you know, throwing a blanket on things with these interest rates and, and that may bring prices back down. Um, anecdotally, I just got a, a requote on something we built. So we had our TGI floor joist package for the exact same model we built, uh, end of 2020, start of 2021, we had 2,800 was our price for the engineered floor joists. Just got the exact same package requoted at 13,800. Oh my God. (laughs) $11,000 increase in, in the floor joists. So, so we're talking, what is that? Five times the price? Five times. Yeah. Yeah. Two by fours actually came down though. They're like uh, eight bucks, you know, where they, pre-pandemic i think we were about 250 so yeah <laughs> it's, it's the, the volatility it makes it so it's difficult a, to underwrite these projects right it, yeah it's, it's a new world you know i'm pricing out a very big project right now and, and you know we're building the spreadsheet with the ability to just go in at any time and just start updating the numbers one after another and you need that these days because things just change like crazy yeah it's like how do you price for it yeah if you're selling units pre-construction you have to like basically build in a buffer knowing that it could happen and, uh, yeah. Well, you know what? You, you build in a buffer and then you hope that, um, mm-hmm. and it's, at least it's been true over the last two years that on your pro forma as, um, costing increases, so does top line revenue. Right. Cause right. Yeah. People will these, just adjust the end price of the house. Uh, yeah. And but if you pre-sell, costs, if you pre-sell, then you have a locked in price. That's, that's where it gets a little tricky unless you have yeah. an escalation clause in, in your, in your project. And you just hope that, I mean, you hope that you have your costs locked in before you, um, mm-hmm. uh, you go to market and pre-sell and, and most yeah. guys do. Um, but I mean, that's not stopping in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. trades and, and suppliers yeah. from coming back and retrading. Right. Um, and then there's nothing you can do as a developer. You yeah. can say, no, you're not allowed to do this, but if they walk, they walk, then you have to go back yeah. to the market and re- renegotiate a price. Um, yeah. so the, the problem is going to occur, I, I think, and, and I can kind of see this happening where, you know, costs continue to either stay flat or, or increase. And then you have a, mm-hmm. a drop in, in revenue based on reduced market pricing. Yeah. Um, and then that's when you're going to start to see projects go under and they're um, going to pause uh, or, or, go under, or yeah. pause or the, yeah. the market's going to shake up, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it's uh, the, uh, I like what you said before. There's, um, you know, dozens of different forces sort of pushing in, in each direction and mm-hmm. um, you know, how it shake, shakes out over the next 12 or 18 months is impossible to say. Yeah, exactly. And I, on my last podcast, I had someone say that, uh, you know, anyone who, who answers this with like confidently, like with that, they know what's going to happen is, you know, like, um, you know, not educated on the subject. And I think that being able to admit that no one knows and just acknowledge the forces is probably the best we can do. It's that's, that's really what it's going to come down to. And then kind of position yourself so that it won't matter. (laughs) That's all you can really. Yeah. 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 And and react, react as quickly as possible with new information. Mm -hmm. But yeah, once you get over four or five variables, not even, uh, um, you know, the highest power computers can figure out a, uh, a logical, you know, reasonable outcome. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Patrick, where do people find you, reach you? How do they connect with you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Patrick Harris. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, happy to, to discuss, um, new deals on both the investment side and also on the brokerage side, if, uh, groups are looking to get into the market or, uh, or transact on, on okay. existing uh, assets. And the type of projects you're, uh, you're, um, best able to help, like what, 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 uh, what type of projects would, would you be the best, uh, in terms of a fit for helping people with? Yeah. Uh, multifamily and development verticals, um, mm-hmm. kind of go hand in hand, but anything land or, or apartment related, okay. um, our team would be able to assist with. Perfect. Okay. And then any words of wisdom for people who want to get into this space, land assembly developments, um, uh, you know, even flipping contracts. I don't know what, what, um, what are some words of wisdom that you have for them? Um, start tomorrow start tomorrow. Um, if you're looking to get into it, uh, there take action. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, 
you know, I, I think that um, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, metaphors I could throw out there, but you learn so much more by actually taking action and, and sort of going through it yourself. And once you get out on the other side of, uh, after you have a couple under your belt, um, uh, it seems so simple, but uh, I, that's what I see. It's, it, especially guys in brokerage, you know, are looking to get into it, just, just mm-hmm. start and uh, try and learn as much as possible. Yeah. Well, I can say like, you know, coming from the space you, you are in working for Cushman Wakefield, you've obviously been exposed to a whole new world that most people never see. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's tough to, to figure how people get a foot in that door without some sort of insider knowledge and whether it be from working with somebody like you and kind of learning from you. And then obviously you help them as an agent or, or what have you, um, you know, there's gotta be some sort of angle to learn that, that, uh, that subject matter. Yeah. And you know what, there's, um, it's totally different now. Like I grew up in an era where, you know, all this information is available online, right? You can mm-hmm. go and you can see pretty much every marketed listing in that, uh, in an area, you can look at the, mm-hmm. um, secondary plans on, on municipal websites. Um, mm-hmm. it's all the information is available at your fingertips, it's just about, um, mm-hmm. you know, going out there and, and starting and, uh, uh, try to constantly learn. Cool. Well, that was awesome, man. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad we had a chance to connect and it was great talking to you. So hopefully we can meet face to face one day. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. I'll see you on the next one.